So we've had a broad overview of what the comparative studies are like. Now you have to think about how would you plan for one. A comparative study essay generally takes a lot more preparation than your regular thematic essay because you don't just need to know about the text, you need to know about the structure and you also need to know about the time and place. So the first thing you want to do is gather notes on each text individually. So reread or rewatch relevant sections of the text and jot down little notes as you go. Review notes from your teachers and tutors, so that's a good time to get out the highlighter and see what's relevant and what you can incorporate back into your essay later. You can also think about using study websites, so Sparknotes and HSC Online are a couple of examples. Sometimes these sites are really useful and sometimes they're a little bit dodgy, so just make sure that you take what you get with a grain of salt. You can find online reviews or essays by academics or critics. This is usually a really good source of information. So you should look at online newspapers like The Times uh, or The Washington Post, which often do kind of arts reviews. They're the really good places to go. Make general notes on the time and place of the text and on the genre or on the composer. So sometimes that can be information that you get out of web encyclopedias. For films, you might also think about using IMDb or YouTube. Um, they might have good resources to get you started. So it might be that you can review watching a little bit of the film, or that it can tell you things like the director and the publish date, which you know you need to include in the introduction of your essay. So the next thing you have to do once you've done all of this research is think, why have we put these two texts together? What kind of comparison are you being asked to do? So hopefully, having thought about all of the slides that we just looked at, you'll be able to figure out what kind of comparison you're being asked to study. The next thing you want to do is make a similarity and differences table. So you're going to think about the elements of that comparison. So supposing the comparison was thematic, you might put down all of the themes that were similar in both texts. If it was a genre comparison, you might list all the possible conventions of the genre. And then you're going to contrast how those conventions are used in each context. So you want to think about similarities but also differences at this point. So we're going to show you an example of what we mean. So if we were thinking theme, uh, we might have the question, how is humanity conveyed in both texts? So these texts are actually ones that you might get in Year 12. So we have text one, Frankenstein, text two, Blade Runner. And if I had more room, I would have put the date and the composer's name in that as well, as well as any brief information that might have helped me to understand the text in that box. So then I have to think about, is what I'm comparing a similarity or a difference? So in this case, they both think about the idea of humanity, so it's a similarity. So the similarity is that there's a monster who has an interesting identity, and there's also a genetic replicant that has an interesting identity. And I have to back this all up with a quote. There's no point finding the comparison if I can't quote about it in my essay. So I've picked two quotes that are similar. I am your fallen angel from Frankenstein and from Blade Runner, fiery the angels fell. So obviously your list would go on for a lot longer than mine. You wanna make sure that you compare, first of all, the obvious stuff, but then think very critically and make many minor comparisons as well. The next thing you want to do after you've taken care of the reason why you're doing that comparison is to make another similarities or differences table for the other elements in the texts. The things that are there but are not the reason you're doing the comparison. So if we were doing genre, then we might compare other elements like textual techniques, themes, purposes, characters or contexts. So these won't be the backbone of your argument, obviously, because you're going to be focusing on whatever the comparison asks you to focus on, but it does really help you to have deep analysis and to really think about the way the texts work together. So we've talked a little bit about context already and we keep bringing that word up, but what do we mean by a cultural context? So a culture is a way of life of a group of people. The behaviours, beliefs, values and symbols that we accept generally without thinking about it too much. They're kind of just assumed knowledge. So the tangible parts of a culture, the parts that you can kind of see and touch, are symbols, heroes and villains, rituals and values. So a symbol can be a word, a gesture, a picture, or objects that carry a particular meaning, which is only recognized by people who share a particular culture. 
So obviously we can see here that the hand signal that they're showing is peace. And the circle with the lines through the middle of it, which could mean something completely different to other cultures, is also a peace symbol in our culture. So without actually using the words or indicating in any other way, we recognize that. So lots of acronyms we use, like ATM, RTA, those sorts of things, um, or even brand name clothes or advertising icons are symbols of our culture. So most people, when they see a big M, do think of McDonald's, and when they see a tick, they think of Nike. The word doesn't have to be said, it just comes up in your mind. And that's one of the ways symbols communicate to us in our culture. Heroes and villains. So these are people who are past or present, real or fictitious, who possess characteristics that are highly prized or hated in the culture. So they don't even have to be a real person. They can be somebody like Uncle Sam. Um, they can just be an idea, but there's something that people are either worried about or really want to emulate themselves. So obvious ones from Australian culture are Ned Kelly and Don Bradman. Uh, and villains in our culture tend to be the police or politicians. So it's often authority figures for Australians because we haven't quite forgotten that convict heritage. Rituals. So these are collective activities. So an activity that you do with a group of people. It's sometimes an unnecessary activity, but it's considered socially essential. They're carried out most of the time for their own sake, so there's not necessarily any gain to them. So it might be ways of greeting. So do we shake hands? Do we bow? Paying respect to each other. So it might be nodding when you walk past someone in a corridor. And religious and social ceremonies. So we're going to have a look at some of those. Our rituals might include days like Christmas, Easter and New Year, and activities such as giving flowers or drinking toasts. So obviously those activities in different cultures are done different ways. So for instance, in Australia on New Year's you usually get drunk and have fireworks. That seems to be the predominant thing to do. But in other cultures at New Year you might hand out red envelopes with money in them. So it might be the same ritual but they carry it out in different ways. And the most important one is values. So values are broad preferences for one state of affairs over another. So liking good better than evil. A lot of values are unconscious even to those who hold them. So you might not really have sat down and ever made a list of what your values are, but if somebody asks you the right provocative question, it will be obvious what your values are. So if we were going to look at modern culture, we could say that maybe some of the values are facts, information, education and science. <clears throat> we might think money and wealth is also a really big part of our value. And probably one of the more defining values of our postmodernist culture, so between now and say 30 or 40 years ago, is the openness about sex and sexual desire. So it's used a lot more in advertising and things like that, and we're all a lot more comfortable and relaxed about the idea. So values are of course the most important part of a culture, and you can't really do a comparative essay without mentioning the terms values. So now that we have a brief idea of what culture is, we're going to look at it over the next couple of videos over a number of different literature contexts. So we're going to look at the Renaissance, which is where texts might come from like John Donne and Shakespeare. We're going to look at the Revolution and Restoration, which doesn't have too much literature to it, but a famous one is John Milton's Paradise Lost. There's also the Age of Enlightenment, where you've got figures like um, Newton and Voltaire. The Romantic Era, where you've got poets like Coleridge and Wordsworth. The Victorian Era, where you have novelists like Charles Dickens. The Modern Era, where you have writers like T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf. And the Postmodern Era, where you have writers like George Orwell and probably most of your famous or favourite writers today. So the Postmodern Era is supposed to be extended into now as well. So we are going to go through each of those ideas individually and explore the contexts, as well as thinking about how we might write a comparative essay on them, and thinking also about how you might do creative writing set in any of these periods. So hopefully once you've done that, you'll have explored the uh, culture and understood it really well. But it might be a good idea before your next video to have a quick look at these ideas on Wikipedia. That's the end of this lesson.